on, Jimmy. <laughs> You're gonna fight against when this balloon of yours goes up. Forces of anarchy, wreckers of law and order. Let's see? Communists, Maoists, Trotskyists, Neo Trotskyists, Crypto Trotskyists, Union leaders, Communist Union leaders. Let's see? Atheists, agnostics, long haired weirdos, short haired weirdos, vandals, hooligans. The government. Okay, thank you, uh, Graham, for being with us today. Um, I've got a bunch of questions I want to ask you. And, well, first I was wondering, could you maybe perhaps tell us a little bit about your intellectual background and um, where you studied and the like? Yes, I became interested in philosophy at the age of 16 simply because we had a set of encyclopedias at home, and I used to read in the encyclopedia about any topic that crossed my mind. And one night, uh, it occurred to me that I didn't really know anything about philosophy. So I sat down and read the philosophy article straight through, and that's the moment I knew what I wanted to be. Really? And, uh, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, it was one of those conversion experience moments. What, what was that like? Uh, can you recall that? I'm, I'm just curious. I can. I, I was simply uh, impressed by the fact that people had taken such intellectual gambles in framing these entire theories of how everything in the cosmos fits together or fails to fit together. And it seemed like there was so much room for new such theories to be introduced and defended. It seemed like an adventure in the making. So you went on, um, I, I presume, you, did you study uh, philosophy at, uh, at high school or did you start it, so, sort of study it in a formal way at university? We don't really have philosophy in American high schools. I mean, if you get lucky, you might have attend a private school where there's someone who happens to teach it, but it's generally not part of the curriculum in the United States. So most people encounter philosophy first as a required university course. However, I, I went to an unusual undergraduate institution. It's called St. John's College, and there are two, uh, there's a campus in Maryland and a campus in New Mexico, and it's the most ultra-classical curriculum available in the United States. It's everybody learns ancient Greek, and you start with Euclid's geometry and translating Plato's Mino and it's all classic texts. Everybody takes exactly the same curriculum and runs from Plato up through, usually up through Freud. Lately, they've been adding a little Husserl and Heidegger to the curriculum experimentally, maybe Wittgenstein now and then. But it more or less goes from Plato through Freud, or it did in my time. Uh, so you can't get a more classical education. And mathematics is part of it. History of science is part of it. You even get a year of music just because it was one of the traditional liberal arts. I think that's interesting. I mean, given what you write and your interests, you're such a wide range of interests. I think that, I think that influence is still still present in your work. Yes. What the St. John's education really gives you is an inability to be intimidated by anything. I mean, <laughs> once you've learned, once you've learned calculus from Leibniz's papers, it's hard to be scared about anything. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Even if it's outside your area of expertise. And uh, you went on then to study, uh, I know you did grad work at Penn State, is that correct? And, yes. And um, DePaul, you did your doctorate work. Yes. Uh, after the St. John's education, which is so classical, I was hungry to do a lot of ultra-contemporary stuff. Um, and I, I ended up studying a lot with Alfonso Lingus at Penn State, who wasn't, he wasn't the one I went there to study with, but he was immediately such a fascinating person. And I became interested in the things he was working on, such as Levinas. Yeah, Alfonso uh, Lingus, he's still uh, uh, he's, 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 he's still working, right? He's just about to release his latest book, Irrevocable. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I saw I think I saw him in action once. He's uh, uh, yeah, he's a really, really, really sort of passionate, engaging, imaginative. He's really somebody who gets you fired up. He really is, and he's a, a wonderfully eccentric human character <laughs> who has his house was always a, a welcoming place for graduate students. You could just drop in unannounced, and that's because he did all of his work early in the morning, and that way he was prepared for any surprise encounter. Someone would just show up at his house at night. <laughs> yeah, um, and so you then did your doctoral work, I think, at DePaul, is that correct? That's right, which seemed to be the best place at the time to work on Heidegger and later figures in America. Yeah, sure. So it's like, a, I mean, it's well known, DePaul, as a, a really good place to study what is called continental philosophy. Right. Yeah, um, and also I think one thing I'm really want to, curious to ask you is that you were you did some sports writing I think on the side or did you work professionally as a sports writer? Is that correct? I did. Yes, it wasn't a salary position. I got paid by the article, and that was simply a chance opportunity that came my way. But it was very important to me because uh, it, it forced me to write on deadline and in a lively and interesting way. And I had been a typical sort of procrastinating student who had many incomplete 
grades at one point for not finishing my my seminar papers on time. The sports writing changed that. It made me realize the importance of writing quickly and getting right to the point. It's a, it's a life changing experience. I think something a lot of all all academics could probably um, uh, all academics could probably learn from that. Uh, what did you write about? Was it what type of sport? May I ask? Well, they gave me a, a very wide range. Um, I did some actual reporting where I covered sporting events in Chicago. And, uh, but, but I was allowed also to write general opinion pieces about national sports in general, and they'd pay me by the article. And do you think that, and you think that type of writing is still something that informs you today? I think so. Uh, I've just written this new introduction for Pelican, Object Oriented Ontology, A New Theory of Everything. And I think some of my sports writing skills, I hope, are in evidence in that book. And I'm writing another book for Penguin uh, that I'm just about to get started on. Okay. So um, I guess we could probably talk about um, uh, your main work, really. And uh, you are one of the primary exponents of object-oriented philosophy. So I'm wondering, could you maybe tell us a little bit about what that is about, what it stands for? Sure. Uh as the argument goes today, most forms of Western philosophy and Western thought in general have been anti-object oriented. They've been attempts to reduce objects either to what they're made of or what effects they have, which I call undermining and overmining. And uh, a great deal of what passes for human thought is simply a way of getting rid of the object and replacing it with something smaller or larger. And that's not an exhaustive description of the history of Western thought. There have been several object oriented traditions. There's, of course, Aristotle's theory of substance, individual substance, which uh, reemerges in Leibniz and, of course, throughout the scholastic period before that. There's also Kant's thing in itself, which no one seems to like, the thing that we can know is there but can't know anything about. There is uh, – oh, there's the tradition of Whitehead and Latour, we're going to talk about a bit later, which is very much focused on the individual entities. Well, Whitehead calls the ontological principle that everything that happens – can be explained in terms of one or more actual entities, that entities do all the work. And then finally, there's the phenomenological tradition, one of the great object-oriented traditions. It actually starts a bit earlier, uh, before Husserl and the other Austrian thinkers, such as Meinong and Swarovski, and coming up into Husserl and then in, again into Heidegger, who I would also call an object-oriented philosopher. But there's something in each of those traditions I don't care for, and that's what makes object-oriented philosophy different. So, for instance, in the Aristotelian tradition, there's the problem that uh, he overemphasizes natural objects, things that exist by nature. This is best seen in Leibniz, who's very hostile to machines and other aggregates, uh, which he sees as not really uh, having met. The Kantian tradition, I, I'm one of the few people today who defends Kant's thing in itself. The usual move is to get rid of it and to say that it's contradictory, it makes no sense. I think it makes plenty of sense. The problem with Kant's thing in itself is not that it's unknowable. The problem is that he restricts it to the human sphere so that it's only we poor humans who can't get into the thing in itself. Whereas object-oriented philosophy sees the thing in itself at work even in inanimate causal relations. Uh, the whitehead Latour tradition emphasizes relations too much, it tends to reduce entities or actors to the effects they have on other things and how they're affected by other things. Whereas for object-oriented philosophy, the object withdraws or is withheld from relations. And then uh, as for the uh, phenomenological tradition, in a way, I'm trying to combine the various insights of the various figures in that. But the phenomenological tradition, as its name suggests, is very much focused on how the world appears to humans, whereas uh, we widen the problem in object-oriented philosophy. It's a general theory of objects and relations, whether humans are there or not. So when – right. So what, thank you for that. That's 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 really good um, uh, summary of your entire uh, oeuvre uh, and very clear – um, so when you're saying the word object, I think you're not perhaps using it in the way it's conventionally understood, as in you don't, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're not using the word object in the, say, the way we might use it in everyday conventional sense when we refer to a thing. When you refer to the word object, you're talking, you could talk about lots of different things. It could be like a cup. It could be, uh, it could be a whole host of singular things like cups and pens and um, I'm just looking across my desk here, phones or whatever. But it also could be plural things like, say, I don't know, a football team or uh, a scientific concept or an imaginative concept. Yes. Uh, in philosophy, object is usually opposed to subject these days. And this is why some people have asked me why I use the term object, because it seems to suggest opposition to a subject. Well, there's a historical reason why I use the term object, which is simply that 
it's the Austrian tradition, Husserl and earlier, uh, where they use this word object in the way that I do, where a general theory of objects means a way to talk about everything and not just certain uh, spheres of reality, but to talk about all of reality, which is what philosophy has to do, of course. And so I kept that term object. I don't oppose object and thing the way Heidegger does, because I think it's important to have synonyms. So for me, object, thing, entity, units, all of these words are interchangeable. Um, I think any attempt to make them more precise and differentiated than that would be somewhat pedantic. Now, the other thing, as you've noted, in everyday language, object usually means something like a hard, durable, solid, physical thing that you can move around. Uh, in, in the arts context, for example, this is also what it means. When I defend objects, people in the arts sometimes wrongly think I'm defending painting and sculptures and I'm opposed to performance or conceptual art, which is not the case. Object for object in philosophy simply means something that's not reducible fully either to its parts or to its effects. It's that third level in between uh, reducing a thing downward and reducing a thing upward. So, and this is why, well, one, I guess this is why, you know, it's kind of, as you said yourself, is a type of a type of theory of everything. And another word for that is it's a metaphysics. And in addition to that, what you are trying to articulate is a type of realism. Now, a realism in a very, very basic sense, as I understand it, would be an attempt to articulate what the nature of an object is outside of a cognitive understanding of it, perhaps? Yes, that's the, the sine qua non is the, for any realism, is the notion that there is a world outside the mind. However, I don't think it goes far enough, to put it that way, because uh, the mind is not the only thing with an outside. And so again, realism also, for us, implies the fact that objects are something outside of their interaction with each other. So to use the old uh, example that I love from medieval Islamic philosophy of fire burning cotton, when the fire burns the cotton, the fire and the cotton only make partial contact with each other, even though the fire ends up destroying the cotton in most cases. Uh, there are many features of the cotton that the fire has no interest in or has no relevance to the fire, I should say, because I'm not saying the fire is conscious. But the fire and the cotton only encounter each other as caricatures. It's not consciousness that changes the world into caricatures. It's simply relation, per se, that does that. Relation is automatically a translation. There's no direct contact between any two things. It's not just that we poor humans are trapped in the 12 categories in space-time of Kantian finite understanding. It's that all objects are finite, and therefore all objects do not encounter each other directly. All interaction, all relation is mediated. Okay, okay, okay. So all uh, all objects in some way relate. Okay, now, uh, that makes me think of, um, uh, you know, sorry, I come from a phenomenological background, so that makes me immediately think of Heidegger. And what Heidegger is famous for uh, when thinking about objects, and you have a great deal to say about this, but I think the conventional view of Heidegger when it comes to the use of things is that, at least the conventional view is that the situation precedes the object in his, you know, in his very, very famous opposition between, um, ready to hand and present to hand. Uh, the, uh, he talks about the ready to hand as if it's the situation which has preeminence. I don't think that's what you're saying. You're trying to push Heidegger in a different direction. Yes. In a way, uh, the whole of my career comes out of an attempt to really understand Heidegger's tool analysis. Uh, which is published in Being in Time, but is actually eight years older than that from his 1919 lecture course. And you're right. Uh, Heidegger does seem to emphasize the totality of the system of equipment, if that's what you mean by situation. He says, in being, he says in Being in Time, strictly speaking, there is no such thing as an equipment in the singular. Everything's referred to everything else. And it's true. He does say that. However, uh, it contradicts what he says about broken equipment, failed equipment, or anything that turns up missing, anything we notice. Because uh, if nothing had any surplus beyond the current situation, if everything were nothing more than what it were in the current situation, you couldn't have broken tools. Nothing would ever change. And so in the process of reading through this tool analysis, it occurred to me that I had to read it exactly the opposite way from how Heidegger reads it himself. And so I ended up with the idea that there's something deeper than readiness to hand. And that deep, what's deeper than readiness to hand is objects. And another way to put this is a lot of interpretations of Heidegger get hung up on overemphasizing the difference between theory and praxis. Right? They'll say that theoretical comportment or perception of individual entities arises from this prior holistic background practice, sure, in which, which is unconscious. But when you think about it, to use something unconsciously 
doesn't really get any closer to it than thinking about it does. So right now I'm sitting in this chair. The sitting in the chair isn't really a closer relationship to the chair than thinking about it or making a theory of chairs would be. What's deeper there is the chair itself. And my praxis is a distortion or a translation of that chair itself just as much as my theory is. And so this is what led me to the idea that uh, there's something deeper than both theory and praxis. So that's the first step. The second step is the, the wilder step, according to some people, that they will never accept, which is the idea that objects do this to each other as well. I can sometimes convince people of the first point that uh, theory and praxis is not a distinction that goes deep enough, but I have the hard time getting them to admit that it occurs in inanimate relations too. I see. So let me ask um, a couple more questions in following that idea up. I mean, when we're talking about something like realism, and uh, of course uh, you are, I guess, uh, were, or perhaps still are, one of the primary exponents of uh, what was what is known as speculative realism. And um, what I like about what you're saying is that you you have a real sort of and I see why you're coming out of phenomenological, you have a real sort of love of things and a real love of objects in the world and uh, almost like their inner life in some way, separate uh, to what we, we what, what we might uh, think about them. What would you say to sort of a, someone who would ask a very dumb question like, you know, how do you know what they're like? You know, how, how do you know? How can you tell the story of those those objects uh, in the world? I think, we, I mean, a couple of years back, we had a BBC a series was like a, the history of the world in 100 objects, um, which uh, p- was probably something you'd be interested in, I guess. But, yeah. you know, telling that story, interpreting objects outside of human consciousness, what drives that for you? It's not a dumb question at all. It's very, it's probably the most central objection most people make. They'll say that if we can't say anything about objects which are withdrawn beyond human access, then we're just left with negative theology or we're left with mystical hand waving. But no, that's not the case. What we're left with is indirect contact with reality. And that's not as crazy as it sounds because that's already the basis for several disciplines that exist, one of them being philosophy. If you remember Socrates' arguments, uh, he repeatedly tells us that he knows nothing, he's never been anyone's teacher. Philosophy, of course, itself is philosophia. It's not Sophia. And so it's a love of wisdom. Uh, the wisdom belongs only to a god, not to a human, because we can never get at what the thing is. And there's not one dialogue of Plato where Socrates gives a satisfactory answer. That is true. What, what virtue is, what friendship is. And so I'm simply trying to reclaim the original meaning of philosophia, whereas the modern tendency has been this desperate attempt to mimic mathematics and the natural sciences, that philosophy must be a kind of knowledge, and therefore it must be deduced from some unshakable first principle. The problem is none of these first principles ever stay unshakable for very long. Right? Even uh, you know, no one necessarily starts where Descartes, Descartes or Kant started today. So I think that's simply the wrong way to go about philosophy. And I, I have a, some backing here in Alfred North Whitehead, who I think may be the best metaphilosopher we've had in centuries. Uh, Whitehead uh, talks at the beginning of Process and Reality about – and he was a mathematician, of course. He talks about how wrongheaded it is to take mathematical deduction as the – standard method for philosophy. It's, it has a derivative status in philosophy. Philosophy, as he puts it, is descriptive generalization. And philosophies are abandoned, not refuted, according to Whitehead's. You, you don't give up a philosophy because somebody came up with a knockdown argument. You give up a philosophy because it suddenly seems too narrow, doesn't isn't able to account for wide swathes of experience the way you thought it was, was able at one point. So I think these people, I call them modern rationalists or neo-moderns or neo-rationalists, I think simply misconceive what philosophy is. Now, your question was about uh, how do we get any access to things at all? Sure. The, art, the arts give us another example. Uh, no one, no serious observer of arts, I would say, thinks that the arts primarily provide knowledge. I mean, there may be cases where artworks can teach you things, but uh, what makes an artwork different from an encyclopedia or a textbook is there's something a little bit more than the teaching of a literal message. Art. Art creates objects, as I see it, as does architecture. It creates objects that can never be fully knowable. And this is why art critics and architecture critics write the way they do. They don't write in discursive propositional language. They write somewhat like poets. And at their worst, they can be very pretentious about it. But at their best, they're the best prose writers we have. There aren't many people who write better than, than Clement Greenberg or some of the better architect, uh, architectural critics we have. These people know how to write because they know how to circle the thing they're talking about and allude to it, hint at it without reducing it to a, a prose statement. So I'm guessing this is why you are receptive to a, sort of a limited reading, I can't if I can put it like that, that in some way you are acknowledging that we are in some way limited in how we understand reality in itself or the thing in itself, yes. but, and in some sense our 
the concepts we have are always uh, already some type mediated in some way. So like you might be a Wittgensteinian, you might say our access to reality is, uh, is I don't know, is, is, uh, is mitigated by language or you're a post-structuralist, it's mitigated by the referral of signs or whatever. But you are trying to carry forward a Socratic impulse really still, I think. That is that yeah. in some way, well, for, put simply for Socrates, I mean, I, I don't think I could put it any simpler that sort of uh, ignorance is constitutive of knowledge. Yes, which became uh, learned ignorance in Nicholas of Cusa in the late uh, Renaissance, early modern period. I would just say there's one difference here between my position and Socrates, which is that Socrates was always careful not to talk about nature. He thought he first had to understand himself. And for me, this is the beginning of the unfortunate modern taxonomy, where people think the difference between the humanities and the sciences is one of subject matter. So that uh, sciences talk about inanimate stuff, more or less, and humanities talk about human stuff. Problem with that is the sciences no longer respect that division of labor themselves. You have the cognitive scientists coming along and saying, hey, we can explain the human, too. But uh, I think the philosophy should be more bold about talking about the natural world. And this doesn't mean we step on the toes of science. We simply talk about the natural world in a different way from how the sciences do. We can go back to doing a metaphysics of nature or something of the sort. And I, could, I, could get, I could get on with that. I could get on with that. I mean, that's I mean, it's still very phenomenological in spirit, that at least but the idea that in some way phenomenology as philosophy is is, is is foundational. And in some way, I think what you're saying is that, you know, science, uh, philosophy, the arts, economics, that these things can be taught on a continuum if that's the right word, yes. uh, rather than as discrete subjects. Yes, that's right. Uh, as for phenomenology, I was also importantly shaped by phenomenology at an early age. I was in, interested in Husserl even before I was interested in Heidegger, which Heidegger sort of started my sophomore year as an undergraduate. Uh, the, the difference, I would say, is that for phenomenology, it always comes back to what manifests itself to human consciousness, whereas uh, – for object-oriented philosophy, it's not just about how the world is mediated for the human observer. The world is mediated in any relation at all. So it means that uh, the cause is always absent from its effects as well, because any effect is a translation of the original causes. So uh, it's always important to emphasize that we are trying to extend the model of human translation of the world to all entities, which is the thing Kant never did. And in fact, I think that's one of the great counterfactual crossroads in the history of Western philosophy. One of these days, I plan to write a history of Western philosophy where I talk about the moments where things could have happened differently. And I think that's one of the most recent important ones. Instead of German idealism, you could have had German realism. And what I mean by that is, if you think of German idealism as saying, well, Kant was this great genius except for this stupid point about the thing in itself – because you can't think a thing outside thought without turning it into a thought, and therefore the noumenal phenomenal distinction is imminent, and you know you pass through the ultimately in Hegel you pass through that imminent difference in a number of stages to gain absolute knowing, attain absolute knowing. Uh, I, what I would say is that Kant was a genius precisely in his discussion of the thing in itself. His mistake was not in that. His mistake was in thinking that the thing in itself simply ha haunts human cognition. Instead, the thing in itself haunts every relation, and this could have happened. This is not some wild historical speculation. This could have happened because the Germans before Kant were Wolfians, meaning they were Leibnizians. And so there was already this broader sense of what could count as perceiving that German philosophy had from Leibniz. And so it would have been very easy for German philosophy to take that direction. And so in some ways, object-oriented philosophy is simply German realism 200 years later than it should have happened, except it's no longer in Germany, where they're still very imprinted by the post-Kantians that did it. Arise. Well, when would you say you had your breakthrough? Your, 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 your. Um, you know, I mean, Derrida famously talks about, uh, you know, his grammatology um, as the moment when he was doing something else. When he was, uh, uh, when he was, when when he was doing something beyond sort of phenomenological interpretation, which he'd written lots and lots on uh, in the nineteen fifties and sixties. But he saw he saw the grammatology as a, you know a decisive way of thinking or a transformative way of thinking. When did that happen for you? Do you think very melodramatically on Christmas morning in nineteen ninety seven? It's it's a fun story. Uh, the background is that. I was sort of doing my semi-mature work already in my master's thesis and beginning of writing my PhD, where I was simply trying to take Heidegger's tool analysis and push it as far as it could go, uh, where I was saying, actually, all of Heidegger's philosophy is contained in German, the tool analysis, and I was simply trying to unpack everything that meant. Now, I was uh, not too clear about the metaphysical underpinnings of that. What would that entail? 
I was still thinking of it in terms of the human world interaction. So you could say I still hadn't really made the break- breakthrough to object-oriented philosophy. And then what happened is I had a classmate by the name of Daniel Seltzer, who's now at Duquesne in Pittsburgh, uh, who was very good at harassing me uh, with these sorts of questions. You know, what about the ontological framework in which this was occurring? Was I was it an idealist one? Was I trying to say that everything revolves around this human world correlate, as Mayasu would later call it? And I so I in response to his his needling, I thought quite a bit about this. And then suddenly on that Christmas morning, ironically, I was supposed to go to Dan's Christmas party that morning. And I stayed away until about 7 p.m. because I had a fascinating thought that morning, which is that this happens even when humans aren't there, that there's no difference in kind between a human encountering a washing machine on a frozen lake and the washing machine on the frozen lake encountering the frozen surface of the lake. And I was trying to unpack those implications all that Christmas morning. I finally caught the last few hours of the party at night. <laughs> and it helped that around that time, somebody told me to read Bruno Latour. That was the next month, January 98. I went up to Toronto uh, to give a lecture at the McLuhan program because I was always interested in Marshall McLuhan. And somebody up there told me to read Bruno Latour that I'd like him. And I think I, I only vaguely knew who Latour was at that point through the so-called hoax. I remember that he was one of the people pilloried in that hoax, but I, I'd never read anything by him. And this person recommended that I read We've Never Been Modern. And so then February 1998, two months after my breakthrough, started reading Latour like crazy and realized this was a kindred spirit because he was talking about individual objects, which Heidegger did not. Latour has a sense of humor, which Heidegger does not. He had me <laughs> la- laughing every For time. sure. And apparently a lot of people came to Latour for that. Gerard de Vries, who's the leading Dutch Latourian, tells me he was drawn to Latour back in the early 80s because he was the only philosopher with a sense of humor. So um, that set the stage for this uh, more mature phase, say, from the time I defended my dissertation in 1999 and the time I left to Egypt. Uh, I arrived in Egypt in August 2000. And then Egypt, of course, is where I really found my voice. Egypt, along with sports writing, was the second great thing that happened in my career, partly because, again, as a graduate student, I was procrastinating, a bit depressive. And there's something about waking up in blazing sunlight every day that does wonders for your mood. So I I felt more energetic in Egypt. I felt happier in Egypt. Uh, They realize over there that we're sort of trapped away from Western academia. And so they're very generous with grant supports. Some are travel supports, and yet the library is also pretty good over there. So there were all the resources I need. It was also very healthy for me, I think, to be physically isolated from the Anglophone Continental Philosophy Establishment. You know, Ernst Meyer, the biologist, talks about new species development, and he emphasizes the role of islands in this. That being on an island allows new species to develop because they're away from the continental predators, no pun intended, and they can simply develop in their own ecosystem. And I felt it was like that in Egypt. I wasn't expected to go to Spep and toe the line because I was 7,000 miles away or whatever it is. And so I could sort of carve out my own niche over there. And this was pre-blogosphere. And so I wasn't really active online. I, w- I emailed a lot in those days. And it was mostly just I had a lot of time to write. There was also the fact that when I arrived in Egypt, I had no chance at tenure. There was a very strict quota system. Philosophy department was already over the quota system. And at one point, they, they decided to institute some exceptions. For anyone with an exceptional publications record, they could possibly offer what they called floating tenure. And that was another motive because I wanted to stay in Egypt. So I said, OK, I'm going to publish like crazy. I need to do that if I want to stay in Egypt. And so I started putting my ideas down on paper. And once you're writing a book a year, it becomes a habit. I know that might sound silly, but it does. It becomes easy. It becomes like working out every morning for people who do that. It's just something you wake up and do. That's all those factors uh, helped me in many ways. And then over time, I'd meet new people who helped me along with my project. In 2008, I met Levi Bryant. I'd actually met Ian Bogost a couple years before that, and then Tim Morton in 2010. And we'd stimulate each other with, with blog posts, with emails, and it became a small community. And of course, there was speculative realism in the meantime, which didn't hold up as well. But I learned a lot from those people, too. I may very well be wrong on this, but the, the speculative realism and your version of it, I guess, object-oriented philosophy, that's something that really kind of emerged from a different ecosystem. It, it emerged from new emerging technologies on the internet, like such as blogs and f- social media groups and whatnot. Yes. Um, and do you think, do you think that object-oriented philosophy is responding to something that was, was, was lacking or that there was a deficit in, in contemporary philosophy? Yes. And in fact, I think speculative realism 
already did that. The whole premise behind speculative realism, even though I'm the only one who really defends it to the hill today, Ian Hamilton Grant may still be positive about the term. I don't know. He's taken this term towards idealism in his second book, but uh, he means something different by idealism than people usually do. But uh, Ray Barassier is, is in an attitude of overt hostility towards speculative realism. Quentin Neassou just sort of dropped the term. I still defend it to the hilt because I think it was a very important event in contemporary continental philosophy. People will say, well, they had not enough in common. Even Zizek has said that. that the group was destined to break up because they had not enough in common. Yes, but we also had an important enemy in common. And we found a name for that enemy in Neassou's term, correlationism. The idea that all of philosophy is simply about the human world interplay, that it can't say anything about anything else. That human being must be 50% of ontology. Right. That you have in one basket, you have human beings in the other basket. You have everything else ranging from uh, cartoon characters to black holes to lightning bolts. It's very implausible. And of course, there are reasons modern philosophy took this turn because human experience seems to be the most certain thing for us. I have arguments against that. But more importantly, uh, there's not, in my view, not a lot of, of good reason to give human being that much priority that much of a, a cut of philosophical territory. And so I think that was certainly something missing in continental philosophy. You know, in analytic philosophy, realism has always been a live option. And to some extent, idealism, although less popular, has been a live option in, among analytic philosophers. In continental philosophy, there's been near unanimity that the realism, anti-realism question is a pseudo question, a pseudo problem. And this attitude comes to us from Husserl and Heidegger, who both had very low regard for this problem. And they have their own ways of saying that we're always already beyond it. Uh, Husserl thinks we're always intending objects outside of ourselves. Heidegger thinks we're always already thrown into a world. But notice that neither Husserl nor Heidegger has anything to say about object-object interactions when humans are not there on the scene. This is the sense in which Husserl and, and Heidegger are still tributaries to Kant, as much as I love them. And Kant is still the dominant modern philosopher. Because he's the one who set that assumption that everyone operates within, which is that you have to start with the human world relation. You have to. You can only get to the object-object relations from that starting point. So, yeah, I will. I'd like. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, Latour, and maybe we can do that in a moment. Um, out of that uh, effort to try and chart a new way in philosophy, I think one perhaps you know that transcends the famous analytic continental uh, divide. You you come up with a position which may, not necessarily uh, speculative realism, but you call it uh, weird realism or infra realism. I think is that right? Yes. So so why why weird or why infra? Infra, which refers to the fact that we're trying to talk about a reality that's not accessible; it's somehow below. And uh, there's a kind of regress there uh, because whatever layer you get to below is not the final layer. So it's not infrastructure in the in the old Marxist sense. You can keep going down and finding objects buried beneath objects, buried beneath objects, buried beneath objects. Um, so infra simply refers to the fact that we're going below experience when we talk about the real. Weird realism, and it's, it's a term that some people like to sneer at, but I think it's an important term. The weird is that which cannot be replaced by its qualities. Whenever we have a, an experience that we call weird or unsettling, uh, it's something where it's inexplicable, that we can't, we can't quite put our finger on what was strange about it. It's like, like the Heimlich. Unheim, yeah, it's, it's like Unheimlich, and it, except that we specify the Unheimlich, whereas for Heidegger, the Unheimlich usually has to do with being as a whole, as opposed to beings, right? That some special mood, whether it be angst or profound boredom, makes being as a whole take a distance from us, and we rise above it all. This is something that in the object-oriented framework never really happens. The weirdness happens on the level of individual objects. And this, for example, is also my objection to Kant's sublime. I don't think there is a sublime in the Kantian sense, because uh, he thinks the sublime – is that which is infinite beyond human magnitude. It's immeasurably beyond human magnitude. And I think the best way to critique Kant's sublime is to look at Timothy Morton's hyperobjects, which I think is one of the most important concepts introduced into philosophy over the past decade. The hyperobject for Morton is one that is, uh, he says, massively distributed, sorry, massively distributed in space and time compared to the human scale. And one of the interesting things about it is that it's not infinite. It's a large finitude. And he, as Morton points out in his book, finitude there's something anthropocentric about it, strangely. In infinity, sorry. Uh, that infinity makes you feel powerful. It makes you feel grand and sublime in your ability to think the infinite. Something narcissistic almost. In a way, yes. Whereas what's not narcissistic is thinking, oh, this plutonium is going to be around decaying for 100,000 years. Or um, uh, this plastic is, is going to decompose over a very long period of time. Or how long did it take to make the petroleum from dinosaur bones and dead plants that we're using up at an alarming rate? That's somehow more threatening to think of very large, finite numbers. And uh, this shows how the object-oriented approach to art is different from Kant's. We simply cancel the sublime 
for us, the weirdness happens at the level of individuals, not at the level of infinity. It's something that's beyond all individuals, as in Kant or even Heidegger. For us, the weirdness comes on the sort of the micro level, not the level of infinity. And of course, this also links up nicely with H.P. Lovecraft, who is one of my hero authors, despite his his rather nasty politics. Like right, so this is the oh, sorry Graham this is the um, this is the Cthulhu chap yeah exactly yes uh, I've read that I've read that that's the only thing I've read by him yeah yeah he um, I talk in my book about Lovecraft it's called Weird Realism Lovecraft and Philosophy I should point out first of all that most people read Lovecraft fairly young he's usually a favorite of bright teenagers <laughs> who start reading his work I didn't read any of that stuff at that age I wasn't reading much fantasy and science fiction after I got through Lord of the Rings so. Um, for me, it was the discovery of my late 30s, and I only re- started reading Lovecraft because the Library of America, which is our black hardbound set of classic American authors, Melville and Mark Twain and Emily Dickinson and the like, uh, finally they devoted a, a volume to Lovecraft. And that made me think, what? H.P. Lovecraft deserves a volume in this series? Maybe he's better than I thought he was. And so I started reading through, and it wasn't an immediate uh, chemistry there. It took me qu- – up until the Cthulhu story, I believe, to really get excited about it. And I think there are two weird things going on in Lovecraft. One of them is the obvious one, and that's the one where he treats his creatures as indescribable in some way. And some people claim that's a tired old horror trope, but it's really not, because what Lovecraft does that the other horror writers don't is that he shows an awareness of the fact that it's an old cliche trope. So he'll say uh, something like, perhaps it would not be entirely inaccurate if I were to somehow suggest that the idol of Cthulhu were vaguely formed from a mixture of a pulpy tentacled head and a dragonoid form. And and yet there was something more than that. There was something about the general outline of the whole that made it especially terrifying. So he's saying, yes, I know it's crazy to say that it's too weird to describe. And yet there was something that was a little too weird to describe about it. So that's one level of weirdness. The fact that there's something that's not translatable into literal language. But then there's the other uh what Lovecraftian weirdness that isn't usually noticed, and it's different. This happens whenever Lovecraft describes things with an excess of detail rather than calling it indescribable. But the excess of detail is, is in itself uh, unable to be visualized. I'm pulling up a, a passage here just so I can read one passage from my book. Please. It's about a city in the Antarctic. And this is actually a complicated passage because what they're actually looking at is a mira- an apparent mirage of the colossal Antarctic city mirrored in the icy clouds – and it turns out that city is actually there. Um, OK, here, here's what he says as he describes this city. There were truncated cones, sometimes terraced or fluted, surmounted by tall cylindrical shafts here and there, bulbously enlarged and often capped with tiers of thinnish scallop discs and strange beetling table like constructions, suggesting piles of multitudinous rectangular slabs or circular plates or five pointed stars with each one overlapping the one beneath. There were composite cones and pyramids, either alone or surmounting cylinders or cubes or flatter truncated cones and pyramids and occasional needle like spires and curious clusters of five. Now, there's no effort there to say that the city was indescribable. It was so amazing that I can't even words want to adjust this. Instead, he's going to the opposite extreme, almost comically so, and giving us the most detailed possible description of something that's still impossible to hold in your mind. And in a sense, these two moments of weirdness are analogous to Heidegger and Husserl, in the sense that Heidegger is always about that which withdraws, that which is indescribable, that which only poets can hint at. And then you have Husserl, much like Picasso, for whom there isn't really a hidden depth. Right. There's a tension between the object as a unity and all these different abschattungen or adumbrations that are hard to hold together with the one thing. And Picasso, too. Everything's flattened under the surface for Cubist painting. And so you've got two different things going on. You've got the, the hidden depth, but that's only half of what object oriented philosophy is about. It's the half people usually confine themselves to. We also have this Husserlian side or this Picassian side or, or a love, a second Lovecraftian side where the object is not hidden. The object is simply in a kind of tense relation with its own visible qualities, not reducible to them. That's what weird realism is about. Okay. Um, so, well, um, th- th- thank you for reading that, Grant. That was, uh, I was just, uh, I was just kind of getting absorbed in the, uh, in the, in the prose. Uh, it does, it does really make a lot of sense to me that what you're saying, I think, because sort of a theory of horror usually is about body horror. It's about, it's a question of embodiment. But I, I get what you're saying because what, from what very little I've read about Lovecraft, it's, he's almost making sort of a metaphysical claim that, you know, existence in some sense itself is weird. 
you know, prior to its effect on the human being. And I think that's 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 what you're uh, you're driving at. I, I'm wondering, just a piece of idle speculation here. I mean, have you ever thought about how your your weird realism matches with the literary tradition of magical realism, or is that just not necessarily any comparison there? I don't really have a worked out theory of magic realism. Um, I think what we see with surrealism is something I've thought a bit more about. Um, I've just finished a manuscript on entitled Art and Objects, and I thought a bit about surrealism there. And of course, the great formalist art critics such as Clement Greenberg have no time for surrealism because for them, they're, they're Heideggerians in a sense, by analogy. They think that what uh, modern painting is about is about the depth, the back, the flat background canvas, that surface content is irrelevant, and that all the avant-garde painter is supposed to do is is show their awareness of the fact that the background canvas is flat, and so they're not supposed to use three-dimensional illusionism or to depict recognizable objects. And so, of course, for them, surrealism looks like 19th century academic arts, even though the objects in surrealist paintings are weird. In that sense, they're crazy. It's still basically three-dimensional illusionistic oil painting, just like the Paris uh, salons of the late 1800s. I think there's more going on in surrealism than that. Uh, I think what's going on is something closer to Heidegger's broken tool. The fact that you're the fact that you're seeing what looks like a recognizable three-dimensional scene almost makes it more threatening when you see some unexpected or unfamiliar objects placed in what seems to be a normal context. Right? That I, I, you know, cubism is wonderful, but somehow cubism is not as startling to your everyday sense of reality as is a giant flaming giraffe standing in the background of a, of a dolly painting. And so I think I think uh, surrealism has gotten a raw deal. It had a brief heyday in the 30s, I suppose. But since the 60s, Dada has been the rage. And it, I think Dada still silently dominates contemporary arts in many ways. Uh, but I think surrealism may have more radical potential in a sense. Okay, thank you. Um, one thing, uh, I, I'm conscious of time here as well. One thing I'd like to chat to you about is uh, your uh, is Bruno Latour. And I, I know you alluded to him already. And um, he's been in the news recently. I think I shared an article with you, uh, which uh, he's, uh, he was, uh, he was, he did participate in the so-called, the so-called hoax where uh, so-called and Brickman uh, very famously uh, well, basically submitted an article of uh, gobbledygooked book to a peer-reviewed journal and it got accepted and this was taken as uh, a moment to satirise postmodern thinkers. Now, Bruno Latour has recently come out and he's trying to take back, I think, um, that debate and he's, he's commenting on, well, he was commenting recently on debates around, you know, post-truth and fake news and all this and environmental conspiracy. And I'm wondering where you are now with Latour. How, uh, where, what are the similarities? What are the differences? And how are you thinking about Latour currently, Graham? Yes, there's a great deal to be said here. And I did read that article. Uh, first, a bit of the background uh, on how I, I've already told you how I came to read Latour. Somebody in Toronto told me to, to read his work. The way I came into personal contact with him was also interesting. Um, I gave a, lecture at DePaul while I was still a no I just defended my PhD and I gave a, a lecture on the tour at DePaul to my fellow graduate students and a few professors at one of the professor's suggestions simply because he was his name was becoming a little more familiar and no one really knew much about him and I'd actually read a bunch of his books by then and after I gave this lecture which is now a chapter of my book towards speculative realism uh, one of my professors, Bill Martin, came up to me and said, you know, you ought to send this to Latour. You'd be surprised how little feedback people at that level actually get. And he had – Bill Martin had had very good success contacting Jacques Derrida and Donald Davidson as a graduate student, and it, those have been very useful contacts for him. And so I, I did send uh, a copy of my paper to Latour through the mail, snail mail. And about a week later, I get this excited email back saying, finally, somebody understands my work and so on and so forth. Oh and, wow! Yeah, it was a thrill for a 31-year-old fresh PhD, of course. And uh, I got to meet him finally that fall at a conference in London and then at dinner at his house in Paris. And we became good friends uh, because we have a number of things in common. And I also will forever be grateful for the fact that here was this big intellectual star who was taking me seriously, even though I was really nobody at the time. I'd, I'd not even published an article before I published my first book in 2002, age 34. I got a very late start. And so he had no real reason to take me seriously, yet he did. And he took my opinion seriously, listened to me, and we exchanged ideas. 
And so I'll always be grateful for that. As for similarities and differences philosophically, I want to start by saying I still hold to the unorthodox view that Bruno Latour is the most important philosopher alive today. And, and I say that for one important reason. As I've mentioned, modern philosophy is basically a taxonomy. It's There are two kinds of things. Number one, humans. Number two, everything else. Those are the two kinds of things. Humans have to be treated in one way. Everything else can be treated in another way. And notice modern philosophy has been horrible even on dealing with animals. There, there aren't very many satisfactory treatments of animals. People talk about animality, which you know, lumps together dolphins and cockroaches and bacteria. So one of the symptoms that we're moving beyond modern philosophy will be increasingly sophisticated treatments of animals and plants, which we're starting to see on the market. I take that as a good sign. Now, what Latour does is he, he simply refuses to accept that taxonomy. And he's not the first after Kant to do that. Um, Alfred North Whitehead, again, one of Latour's big influences, did that as well. Whitehead treats all relations except God's relations to the world as equal in kind. That the human prehension or relation with a table is no different in kind from my coffee mug's prehension of the table, which is a, a sin against modernism in philosophy, because modernism is based entirely on that distinction, that humans have to be treated in some different way, we're special in some way. Now, right now, if you look at the continental philosophy landscape, what's really the hottest position in continental philosophy? When I was young, it was Derrida and Foucault, then when I was a little older, it was Deleuze. Right now, I would say it's Badiou Zizek Meassou. That's a rationalist axis running across three generations. And what they all have in common, great though they all are, I'm a fan of all of them, uh, is that they all assume that this the subject has a special status somehow. This is perhaps most explicit in Zizek, but it's also true of Badiou and Meassou. The human subject has a special status. And Latour is really the only one out there who simply denies that as a starting point. Now, you can you can doubt whether he carries that through consistently. I've doubted that because, for instance, you could call Whitehead a philosopher of nature. You can't really call Latour a philosopher of nature. You can call him a philosopher of science because Latour talks about how humans fabricate facts. It's always there's always a human there on the scene helping create the scientific fact. And that's probably mostly because he works in a philosophy of science idiom rather than in a philosophy of nature idiom the way uh, Whitehead does. So there's a bit of a regression in the tour's position from Whitehead's. However, uh, there are passages in his work where he points beyond that. He'll say that you know the the varnish on a, the varnish has the same relation to the canoe that it's on, as do the husband and wife who are in an argument. Uh, so he's he's really trying to flatten out the difference. A flat ontology, as you uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier in the correspondence before this interview. Um, how does Object-oriented philosophy differ as a flat ontology from Latour. Well, as mentioned earlier, uh, Latour, like Whitehead, I think emphasizes too much the actions a thing performs. The thing is what it does. Latour has called himself the only French pragmatist, and I think that's probably true. There may be a couple others, but he's he's one of the few. Uh, because for him, you get rid of problems simply by looking at what things do. Follow the actors. Now, the reason I can't follow that is because not everything acts. Things sometimes exist for quite a while before they act. Sometimes they never act, which doesn't mean they were never real. A thing is capable of more actions than it's doing right now. And so one of the weaknesses of actor network theory, which Latour and others formed, the most, one of the most obvious weaknesses is that it can't handle counterfactual situations very well. So Latour has written this wonderful history of Louis Pasteur, uh, which is available in, in English as The Pasteurization of France. It's a great book. But in a sense, it so identifies Pasteur with the actions he actually performed that you don't really have any tools there to explore what might other strategies have looked like by Pasteur, because Pasteur simply is the things he actually did. There's no there's no inherent relation between Pasteur at one moment and Pasteur at another moment and Pasteur in another possible world. Pasteur simply is what he does. There are no accidents for the tour. Everything is what it does. So that's the biggest difference. And one of the problems that leads to is that I think he makes a distinction that's very important, but then conflates it with a second distinction that's, that's very different. The distinction that he makes is important is the difference between nature and culture in the sense that he thinks – I'm sorry. I should say a non-distinction. He says that nature and culture is this arbitrary modern taxonomy. Latour makes two distinctions. One of them I think is very important. The other one I think he wrongly conflates with the first one, and I disagree with the second one. The first distinction he talks about is this nature-culture distinction, and he flattens that out as he should. As I've been saying, modern philosophy is, is too over-dependent on this taxonomical distinction between humans on one side, everything else on the other. We're actually a pretty minor species in this vast universe. 
Now, I think that's what makes Latour important. That's what makes him a world historic figure, in my view. I think eventually when we get past modernism, we are going to look back at Bruno Latour as the, the herald of this new age in philosophy, as weird as that sounds to some people now. However, I think he then conflates that distinction uh, with the distinction between the thing in itself and the thing for us. So in other words, he thinks that because he's getting rid of the nature culture distinction, he's also getting rid of the thing in itself. But then he doesn't get rid of the thing for us. He, in other words, in the, in the first case, he privileges neither nature nor culture, he says. He's actually a little biased in favor of culture, like all social scientists are. But at least he's aware that it's a problematic opposition. But then in the second distinction, he thinks he can get rid of the thing in itself, but he keeps the thing for us. That a thing is only its relations with other things. Things have to be patiently assembled and if you talk about black boxes, what is the difference between a Latourian black box and an object-oriented philosophy object? It's that for Latour, a black box simply represents human laziness in not inquiring into all the factors that went into making up an object, right? So we, we think of the diesel engine as a, as a black box. Uh, we treat it as a black box in everyday life because we normally don't get into the whole history and the controversies of whether diesel really invented it or somebody else did most of the work. And for the tour, you can always open up the black box, and the thing really is all the components and all the histories that went into assembling it. Whereas for object oriented philosophy, the, the history of a thing is not entirely relevant to it. Some aspects of a thing's history or composition are inscribed into it, but not all. So to give you an example, Latour and Albini and Eva wrote an article about architecture with which I completely disagree, in which Albini and Eva is a is a good observer of architecture working in an actor network idiom. She spent a lot of time in Rem Kohlhaus's office in New York and she and Latour together wrote this paper talking about how architectural works are not really objects. They're processes. They involve all these procedures, all these translations from drawings to the construction sites. And you can look at any architectural project and see that there's this entire history of actors being assembled that went into making up the building. And I agree with that. I simply disagree that that's architecture. I think that is an, an ethnography of how architects work, and it's very valuable as such. But I don't think architecture is about all the processes that had to go into making the architecture. Those are dispensable. What you're trying to get at is the architectural work itself. And here I also agree with scientific critics of Latour to some extent. I don't think a scientific fact is purely reducible to all the actors that went into assembling it. I think the, the scientific fact has a certain independence from those histories. Uh, so I think he goes a little too far on that point. I think he goes too far when he says that Ramses II, the pharaoh of Egypt, could not have died of tuberculosis because tuberculosis hadn't been discovered yet. Uh, this, these are the excessive moments of Latour's theory. Now, the problem is people get so upset about those sorts of claims that they want to throw out the rest of his philosophy. And they don't see what's so important there. What's so important there is, is the way he puts all actors on the same footing and the way he tries to create this general theory of how objects interact and detach from each other. That is what Latour is going to be remembered for, not the residues of modernism, which are actually much less in his philosophy than in those of his critics. I always thought that with Latour, and this is probably a little naive, that, um, and maybe this is where you sort of distance yourself from uh, his, his, his thought, I always thought that Latour, there was a, uh, there was a little, there was a little the dimension of the uh, theological to it, like that, you know, that he kind of has this idea that all things are equally real and all things are equally relational. And that then kind of allows you to say, I don't know, maybe things like angels are real or I don't know, the astral plane is real or, 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 or whatever. Um, is, would that be fair to say or am I being unfair there? Well, here's the thing. Latour is a serious practicing Catholic and in more rationalist circles, that's reason alone to dismiss him. And he's quite open about that. And in fact, there is a Catholic influence on his thinking and in the sense that his philosophy is filled with mediators, just like the Catholic Church is filled with mediations. You know, if Protestantism is all about the direct access to God by each individual, reading the Bible for yourself and so forth, then you think of the Catholic faith as having to do with confessors and saints and rituals. Uh, you can see the parallel with his philosophy there. However, his, his actual theology is quite a strange one. Um, there's a sense in which in the Modes of Existence project – God is nothing apart from the rituals by which God is worshipped, which, you know, it sounds like Durkheim more than like a theologian. Mm. Or Wittgenstein yeah. even. Yes. So um, also here's the other thing. I would say that Latour may even be more personally religious than Whitehead was. And yet Whitehead, uh, God plays a central role in Whitehead's philosophy, but not so central a role, a role in Latour's philosophy. I mean, there's, there's belief in God in Latour as a person, but there is – you'll look in vain for a place when God actually does heavy lifting – 
in actor network theory. You don't. You could be. You could be a, a radical atheist and still use actor network theory with no problem whatsoever. Is object oriented philosophy atheological? Then? No, because I simply don't know, and uh, I'm suspicious of anything that comes from off the shelf modernism, and atheism is one of those. I'm, I'm very suspicious of. Uh, political leftism for the same reason, because I think it's grounded in a modern ontology. And although the left is way more often correct than the right is, I'm still very suspicious of any political doctrine that emerged from modern ontology like that, because I think the ontology is so flawed. And uh, as for religion, I see no, I don't think religion's the big problem. There are rationalists out there who think that religion is subverting all of Western civilization as we know it. I don't see it that way. Um, the, the problems, for example, with Trumpism and with the environment cannot really be traced to religion. And I'll... You have... Sorry, sorry, sorry to cut across you, Graham. You have had some criticisms from, uh, I guess, well, left-wing Marxists, Marxism, which would be basically, if I understand my Marx, would be based around the idea of commodity fetish, or perhaps that you turn the object into a fetish. Um, that, I don't know, that when you talk about objects, it's another way of talking about consumerism or something like that. Uh, how would you respond to such uh, criticisms, if, I, if I've if i sort of ventriloquated them accurately? Yeah, um, I've actually written an, uh, an article about the uh, commodity fetishism issue. That's in a Polish journal called Eidos, which people can find free online if they want. It's called Object-Oriented Ontology and Commodity Fetishism. I think what's strange about that critique is that it can be demolished just with the first few pages of Marx's Das Kapital. If you read just those first few pages, you'll see that what he's talking about is a theory of value, not an ontology. So in other words, what, what Marx is critic, sorry, what Marx is criticizing as commodity fetishism is the idea that things have value in and of themselves, apart from the social production that went into making them. It's not an idealist ontology where you can't say that things exist apart from social production. And Marx gets very explicit about this. Marx says not everything is a commodity, right? Um, he says wind and water, for example. At least before they're bottled, water is getting bottled now and sold. But at least in, in an earlier state of society, wind and water are not commodities. They're there for everyone to be used. He says even uh, objects bartered among tribes, those are not commodities. And he says giving rent of your corn to your feudal lord is not a commodity. Right? Commodities arise at a fairly late stage in the development of production. And so we're not making any claims about value at all in object-oriented philosophy. I'm not saying that a coat has value outside of human society. I'm saying a coat exists regardless of how each individual person interprets the coat. And that's a, a claim with which Marx would be totally on board as far as I can see from the text. So it's, it, seem, it's a, it seems like a sloppy criticism. Um, I think I, I think I would agree, actually, there. Um, as I, Well, I mean, how do you I mean, Marx is still a materialist. And how do you you know, how do you he would he would be an advocate of decoupling the object of consumerism from the real object, I guess, which I think you would be okay with. Yeah, I, I, I think that what's happening is that this critique is coming more from Frederick Jameson's people than from Marx. You know, with Jameson, you get a kind of idea that politics means transcendental critique of popular culture or something like that. Um, and, and so the human has to be the center. This is the sense I get from from Jamesonians a lot. And this is what these are the people who are calling us commodity fetishists, because, as you say, Marx is really a materialist. There's not everything is subject to the commodity form. Right? You have, it's, it's fairly late in human development that that happens. And there's also people who call us acute. There's one person, actually, Alexander Galloway, accuses us of reducing humans to the level of garbage. And that's another that's even stranger, because here's here's an analogy. Object-oriented ontology, object-oriented philosophy say that all objects are equally objects. So I would say a cat is an object and a dog is an object in our sense of object. No one's going to come along and say, oh, object-oriented philosophy is reducing dogs and cats to the same thing. It's saying there's no difference between dogs and cats. Well, obviously, we know there's a difference between dogs and cats. We just don't think that difference deserves to be built into the very fabric of ontology. It's not central enough. And what's radical about our position is that we're saying the difference between humans and non-humans is also not central enough to be built into ontology, that it arises a bit later. We are not so important in the structure of the cosmos that we deserve 50 percent of ontology for ourselves. Obviously, humans are of interest to us. Humans have a lot of amazing skills and talents that philosophy wants to account for. It doesn't mean that we are ontologically special. So, yes, humans and garbage are both equally objects. 
that means nothing politically. I don't see why anyone would find that the least bit threatening. Of course, I'm not saying garbage has political rights, or that, that garbage should not be tortured or massacred. Or, it's absurd. Politics comes at a later level. Some people want politics to be the very foundation of philosophy, and that's what they're angry about. So um, leading on from that, then, I mean, uh, well, today is uh, quite a, a significant uh, political event in the United States. Um, so just so everybody knows, we're recording on the day of the, let me get this term right, the U.S. midterm elections. That's is that correct? correct. It's just past noon here in Iowa, which is the same time zone as Chicago. It's Central Standard Time. And in roughly... Have you gone vote? I voted early. Uh, Iowa was one of the states that allows early voting, and I was there in the first half hour of early voting because my. <laughs> so oh, can I, sorry, Graham. Can I ask uh, how is how is um, how is your your metaphysics helping you think through these political times? I noticed that you just this very day you are well, maybe not today, but uh, recently you were, you were blogging about this. But I'm wondering if I could get your thoughts on how. Your metaphysics is helping you to understand the political climate that you exist in at the moment. Well, the first thing I would say is that there's no direct link between ontologies and political positions. Sometimes it's thought that there is. I think one of the problems with Badiou is that he thinks his philosophy leads directly to communism. And I, I, there are too many intermediate steps for that to be possible. In fact, great philosophers are usually politically indeterminate. There's left and right Hegelians, left and right Heideggerians left and right Kantians. This is how you know you're dealing with a real philosopher, someone who is so important that they can't be reduced to their use value for one, politi one particular political camp. And, of course, Heidegger's politics were horrible, but he's still probably the most important philosopher of the 20th century. And hugely influential on left-wing philosophers like Marcuse exactly. and so on. Yeah, yeah. And, and liberals like Arendt. So um, it's not that object-oriented ontology is telling me to oppose Trump. It's that basic human decency is telling me to oppose Trump. Uh, this man has flirted openly with dictatorship. He has created a, a, an environment of racial hostility. He's an open misogynist in ways that would have been unthinkable in the last few decades of election cycles. So I think it is simply important to oppose Donald J. Trump with everything we have. And in this midterm election, since he's not running, that means opposing every Republican candidate on principle. I would not vote for anyone short of Abraham Lincoln, who was a Republican in this election. I didn't even have to look at the names. I just circled Democrat, Democrat, Democrat within the first half hour of voting. And we're going to have problems uh, tonight one way or the other, but we're especially going to have problems if the Republicans keep anything because the polls show so strongly for the Democrats capturing the House of Representatives, not, you know, it's 87%, so the Republicans still could get it. But the momentum seems so much on the Democrats' side that there's going to be widespread suspicion of rigging if the Democrats do that poorly. And that's going to create a legitimation crisis. It's going to create a situation where Trump still has untrammeled power, can fire Robert Mueller, the investigator, can take revenge on his enemies, and we could end up in an open situation of nonviolent resistance in this country. I, frighteningly enough, I was seeing that on Twitter last night, people circulating tips for how to nonviolently resist in the United States. I last saw that in Egypt during the revolution. It's frightening that we've gotten to this point. So, right, and you, you lived through the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uprisings in Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Very exciting. Do you find your philosophy or your metaphysics consoling then? Even if you're saying like that one cannot necessarily derive a politics from an ontology or is that not the case? I would say it's very dangerous to try to derive an, a politics from an ontology. And I think this is the mistake being made today, especially by many feminists who have gotten on board too quickly with a kind of anti-essentialist ontology and anti-realist ontology, simply because in recent decades, those kinds of ontologies have done most of the work for feminism. The, the idea that things are socially constructed. But ontologies flip constantly through history. And I think people should realize that there are resources in the ontologies they currently oppose. So if you look back at the time of the French Revolution, it was the conservatives who were the social constructionists. You know, it took all this time to build up all these royal families and all this royal blood. How dare you overthrow that in the name of an abstract natural principle like the rights of man? Uh, that was so it was the opposite situation at the time of the French Revolution. And now it's the left that are the social constructionists. And I expect it to flip again in the future. So I would caution everybody not to overcommit yourselves to an ontology for, for explicitly political reasons. That will backfire at some point. Yeah, I mean, there's there's almost like a, a sort of a transgression of the naturalistic fallacy there that you derive your art from is. Or is that too simplistic? No, I think it's not too simplistic. I think it's that's what's happening. And I think people need to be careful about that. Now, that doesn't mean that ontology has has no use for politics. I, I've written one book on politics, and it won't be my last. It was on Bernard Latour's political theory, more specifically. And what I was trying to do in that book is kind of dig beneath the left-right difference – 
uh, which, of course, is a modern phenomenon from the time of the French Revolution, just like subject-object ontology is a modern phenomenon, and I think they're both going to perish at roughly the same time. Uh, what you have in, in instead of a left-right distinction that I think is more profound is a distinction between truth politics and power politics, as I call them. Truth pol- politics, which is usually on the left but also sometimes on the right, is the idea that we already know the political truth. We're simply being prevented from attaining that paradise by some corrupt interests or by oppression or by – you know, the ruling class or some other evil agency that's preventing us from going back to a Rousseauian state of nature or something close to it. This, of course, you usually find on the left, although you find it among Straussians on the right, at least many Straussians, who will tell you things like the truth is that human nature never changes over time. There's a there's a permanent uh, rank ordering of human types. And so we have to make sure the right people rule and the philosophers need to hide their true views it's just a right wing version of truth politics that they already know what, the, what the, the truth is, whereas the power politics are the people who cynically say there is no truth. Whoever is strongest sets the rule. And you find that obviously on the right in Hobbes and Schmidt and Machiavelli. But you also find it uh, on the left sometimes in identity politics. But it's simply it's a matter of seizing power for your own group. What, what interests me about that is the would regard sort of, I guess, identity politics. In some way, and, I've, and I'm getting this idea from a friend of mine, and she said that what's interesting about identity politics is it's sort of morphed out of a postmodern idea where identity is fluid and protein yes. and shifting into almost a sort of a radical Kantian idea where everything is, you know, well, maybe not Kantian. Well, the idea is that everything is, you know, classified, that, you know, everything is, there's a taxonomy or everything can be categorized, that you have this particular type of identity and you've got this particular attribute. And hence, we get all these different categories of genders and so yes. on. If I were going to summarize uh, my incipient political theory in two principles, the first principle would be politics is not a matter for knowledge. We never really know what's at stake in political debates. We never really know the consequences of our decision. And so we should stop thinking of it as a science or a knowledge. It's not. The second principle, perhaps even more important, is we need to stop framing political theories in terms of human nature. Is human nature good or evil? And the difference on that point has often structured the difference between left and right uh, over the past few centuries, uh, where the leftists usually think humans are naturally good and held back by corrupt institutions. The right tending to think humans are naturally evil and need to be held in check by force. Uh, neither of those is really relevant, I would say, whichever is true, because humans aren't really the central question of political philosophy. And I get, I get this from Latour, this idea that it's inanimate objects that stabilize the political sphere. The point of a politics of objects is not that the chairs and cameras should be able to vote. The point is that they structure political space in a way that renders human nature often irrelevant. And that many of our political changes are made through inanimate objects and structuring them different ways. And so I think we need to look more at that. And that's going to become very obvious when the environment starts really going to hell as it will in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, are you are you currently are you currently worried about the political yes. situation? I think you are. I mean, if you're if you're comparing it to what happened in Egypt, I mean, given the sort of the widespread disruption that was yes. there, um, is that something that you think that can come to the to such an advanced well, maybe advance is the wrong word, obviously. Well, to such a to, what is such a big country as the United States? I hope not. But I've seen some terrible things in the past few years that I never thought were possible here. I've seen a president openly denouncing free press. I've seen um, presidents spreading conspiracy theories about rich Jews like George Soros. I never thought we would stoop to this level that we've already stooped to. And I've never I never thought that if someone like Trump came to power, the Republican Party would be this spineless about opposing him. There's really virtually no one still in the party who has been opposing him in any meaningful way. There have been Jeff Flake and Ben Sass who go through the motions but don't really oppose him. The only brave Republicans are the ones who have quit the party by now, like George Will and, and uh, Steve Schmidt and, and Rick Wilson, others of that sort. Uh, it's simply unconscionable to have this man as president. And as far as getting as bad as Egypt, well, we, we do have functioning institutions here, but the Supreme Court is one of those functioning institutions, and it's, and it's already been subverted. Mary Garland. Uh, yes, and then they put in Kavanaugh, who obviously needed to be investigated a bit longer for these accusations. There was no rush. The only rush to get him on the court, you know, Republicans waited a year with a vacancy when Obama was president. The only rush is that they want his votes in case Mueller's probe is challenged in the Supreme Court, right? And they want uh, they want the Supreme Court to to hold Mueller in check. So the Supreme Court was one of our most important institutions that I thought would save us. I'm not so sure that it will anymore. Um, Republicans in Senate and the House are certainly not holding it in check. And so really it's the Democratic Party 
is our only hope. Whatever it's warts, that's the only hope we have. Plus, Robert Mueller, who's a Republican, but is being supported by Democrats in his investigation. So I am a little bit worried. Egypt was a tragedy. I mean, it was the most exciting thing I have ever seen in person. Uh, you, you never have expected that. One of my colleagues in the political science department in Cairo had actually just finished a book whose last sentence said something like, therefore, there can never be a revolution in Egypt. And he had, he had time to change that, luckily for him, before I went to press, uh, because the revolution started a few weeks later. And it really was the kind of people power that leftists dream of. People in the street nonviolently bringing down a really authoritarian government. The problem is they have ended up with something worse than what they had. Uh, they've ended up with a another military government that's simply a lot more brutal than the one of Mubarak, I would say. And it's, it's ironic that El Sisi said the same thing himself the other day, that the Egyptian revolutionaries had good motives, but they they opened the gates of hell. Um, yeah, I think that's probably right. It's just that the the army bears some responsibility for that. Okay, maybe maybe we should try and on a on an upbeat note if we can. I I appreciate uh, you giving me your thoughts on that because uh, you know we have to we have to talk about what's really happening. Um, well, well, what what do you think the future of philosophy might look like, and what excites you? You know about thinking and uh, new ideas. The great thing about that question is that. No one really knows what the future of philosophy looks like. And also, we all have to place our bets. We're betting our careers on what we think the future of philosophy will look like. If we could see that 30 years from now, a certain research strand is going to dry up, then obviously no one would invest their time in it now. So we, were, we are all taking an existential risk when we place bets on the future of philosophy, the, the bets on whether or not our careers will prove to have been meaningful. I've already stated my bet. My bet is that modernism, which is currently resurgent in Continental philosophy is going to prove to be a dead end. As important as I think Badiou, Zizek, and Mansu are, I think they're on the wrong track, and I'm betting my career on that, uh, because they are still too fixated on the subject and the difference between the human subject and everything else, and that this is really what we need to outflank, and I think Latour's your man if you want to do that. He's really the person who's done it best so far, and if object-oriented philosophy can push that a bit further than Latour did, I will be very happy with how my career went. Graham Harriman, thank you very much for having us. <laughs> thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Thank you for listening to The Well. Our theme tune is Love the Government by Opaka Giraffe and is licensed under Creative Commons. You can follow us on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. 